When we look at a BJT, such as in a common emitter amplifier, we model it as a current controlled device, or a current amplifier, and beta is what you multiply the base current by to get the collector current. Base current times beta equals collector current. And of course, this is an approximation. Beta varies wildly with temperature, with construction, with the collector current, in fact. It's a very wiggly figure. It has a rough curve for a particular type of transistor, and you can build for that curve, but generally, a good circuit doesn't rely on the value of beta, it relies on the presence of beta. It's not that you want beta to be 40 or 70 or 100, it's that it's going to be around 100-ish, kind of, so you can kind of judge for that when you're designing your circuit, but mainly you just trust that beta is going to be pretty big. So whether it ends up being 80 or 90 at any particular moment doesn't matter too much if you design your circuit right. And that is what the emitter resistor is for on the common emitter amplifier. Among other things, it is in charge of reducing the effect of beta. And it does this by allowing the base current to vary to stabilize the collector current. Because normally if you have a constant base current and a varying beta, that means your collector current varies. But if you have a varying beta and you want a stable collector current, you have to vary the base current. And this resistor kind of does that. So I hooked up a circuit, the common emitter amplifier, with no input or output, just the amplifier part, and I measured a bunch of transistors, and I hooked up the same transistors, except this time I just used a single bias resistor with the same total resistance through the collector and emitter. I'll show you the circuit diagram in a moment. But one thing is, my transistors were getting warm, and they were fine, they were within spec, but to make everything nice and even, and this is something you do in a real circuit, I used a little metal clip like this. You just clip it on the transistor. Metal is a pretty good conductor of heat, so the heat spreads into the middle clip here and the transistor stays nice and cool. This is also a technique when you're soldering. If you have a delicate component, you can get a little alligator clip and clip it between the delicate casing of the component and where you're soldering, and most of the heat will go into the alligator clip. Same thing. So in a real circuit, you might have a little thermal pad or a little extra solder or something. So let me show you the circuits I used and the numbers I got. So this is the proper common emitter setup. You have your bias portion and the amplifier portion. So this would be if you were following along on my math in the last video, RC for collector, RE for emitter, and R1 and R2 for the bias. My input power was a 9.19 volt wall wart. And the numbers I came up with, putting in whatever power target I chose, I forgot, but the resistors ended up being 68.2 ohms for the collector resistor. This is measuring with my multimeter because I picked the resistor that's closest to what I calculated that's in my box, and then measure because they can be within 1%. The emitter resistor was 18.4 ohms. R1, the top resistor of the bias, is 1,197 ohms, and the bottom was 270 ohms. So this is my setup. I used the 2N2222A transistor, just the regular breadboard variant, or through hole, I suppose you could say, the little TO92, I think it's called. Anyway, standard one. So I measured, basically I put them in there with the little heatsink on, and I just waited. I had a multimeter measuring the base current and a multimeter measuring the collector current. I just waited until the numbers stopped changing, so the temperature was not varying anymore. In a real situation, of course, the signal would be going up and down unless it's silent, and if it's silent, it doesn't matter. But the signal would be varying, so the temperature would be varying, so it's important. But at stable, at quiescence, once it had equilibriated, my four transistors were as follows. 172 microamps base current gave 51.5 milliamps of collector current. And remember, hooking this up to a speaker, it's all about power. So you have amperage here, and then you have the voltage which combine to be the power. That's why the speaker specifies watts rather than any sort of voltage or amperage, because it's an inductive load, but basically that current. My second transistor gave me 186 microamps 
milliamps of base current for 51.5 milliamps of collector current. Pretty nice figure. You'll see how the base current is different, but the collector current is the same. It's actually a fluke that it's that close because it's not perfect. The next one, I had 178 microamps and 52.2 milliamps. So that's a pretty big difference when you're just looking at it, but think about the magnitude. That's 0.5 and 0.2, so 0.7 difference. Only 700 microamps difference on an order of magnitude of 50 milliamps. That's not that bad. That's going to introduce only a small amount of noise. Human probably won't notice it. And the final one gave me 182 microamps base current for 51.9 milliamps of collector current. So we should be able to see here that there is a number this is hovering around. There's variance, but there's a number here that all of these are hovering around and the base current is varying to match it. So that's this. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, Without something to compare it to, that doesn't mean anything. So let me show you the other circuit. This is the straight bias circuit. It's much simpler and much easier. You have a second power supply giving a base current here. And you would connect your signal here, just like before, and it would vary it up and down. But this would give you your static, quiescent base current, and then the signal would add or subtract from that. This one is, of course, cheaper to do, quicker to do, easier to do, and thus crappier to do. These are the same 2N2222A two 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 transistors, the same 9.19 volts power source here, the same 68.2 ohm and 18.4 ohm resistors. This is the collector resistor and this is the emitter resistor. All I did was move it up here, resistors in series add. The idea was I wanted the current, the target current, to remain the same. So ignoring the bias, you've got the same voltage in, total resistance, and the same transistor. So the collector to emitter throughput is the same as in the previous circuit, so that we don't introduce a new variable. Over here, I have my bench power supply that I configured at 2.45 volts, and this resistor ended up being, according to my multimeter, 9.97 kilo ohms. Now, the way I arrived at this figure was I just picked a resistor and measured it, and then I started my power supply at zero and turned the voltage up, and I didn't have anything plugged in except the transistor. I was using the base to emitter of one of the transistors as if it was a diode. And I just changed the voltage until I got about 180 microamps through here. That looked like a good number. About 180 seems to be around where this wants to be. So I configured that. So with one of the transistors, it was giving about 180 microamps. And then I did the same thing as before. I measured the base current and collector current. For the same transistors, the same four transistors in the same order, I got 177 microamps base current with 52.6 milliamps collector current. Now you can see we're in the same ballpark. We're getting around 51, 52-ish here and around 180-ish here. But that's already pretty weird considering how close it was there. We're only off by five microamps. Five microamps here. And it's stabilized to the same temperature. We're getting about the same current, so it's about the same temperature. And yet we have that variance. But it gets worse. This one here, the one that was the same with a higher base current, ended up being 178 microamps and 50.0 milliamps. So there's much less variance in the base current, much more variance in the collector current. See? The third one, the one that was the highest variance, if we took these as the baseline, they're not. These are all around a middle number, but if we treated this one as the baseline, I ended up getting 178 microamps and 52.2 milliamps. Now that's hauntingly familiar, isn't it? This was the closest base current to about what I was giving it, about 180 with a slight drop, you know, just some little quantum mechanical effects. So it ended up being about 178-ish instead of 180, only a two microamp difference. That was the closest one to it. And we got the number. You see, same temperature, same rough beta in the same transistor. It's not random. It depends on a lot of factors, but those factors are roughly stable for a specific 
specific transistor in a specific situation. You can't count on which transistor and you can't count on which situation because you're mass producing devices that will work in, you know, somebody's living room and then somebody walking their dog in the middle of winter and then somebody working out in the hot gym with the air conditioning broken. You see the theme. But the last one, 178 microamps and 51.0 milliamps. This is all quiescent. This is with no signal or a signal at zero, such as silence. This is the baseline. This is the baseline that the signal will be working with. 178, 178, 178, 177. That's well within margin of error for a dinky little sub $100 multimeter I got out of the hardware store running through a breadboard. There's nothing to vary this current. There is one resistor. There is one power. This Kirchhoff loop, you have a stable base to emitter forward voltage drop as if it's a diode, and this works roughly as a diode whether the transistor is conducting through the collector or not. There's that same voltage drop. But there's nothing here to vary. All of the voltage, every single bit of the voltage minus this steady amount is going through here. There's nothing to vary it, and it doesn't vary. But the collector current varies because the beta is varying between the constructions. They all ended up at roughly the same temperature because they're in the same room. I ran them for about the same amount of time with roughly the same amount of current. So the true variable was the construction of the individual transistors. Little itty bitty differences. And the transistors are clearly not malfunctional. They're not deficient. They're not poorly made. They're all right in a stable range, relatively speaking. The thing is, this is more stable. This is stable indicating that the company that made these transistors is not cheating you. They're making decent transistors, but this tells you that you're going to get a better signal. This is what I wanted to illustrate. The variance here is much more different. The lowest is 50, the highest is 52.6. Here the lowest is 51.5 and the highest is 52.2. So we have a lower variance. This is a small sample size. This is not science. This is a demonstration. Obviously smarter people than me have done all this stuff and this is why we know this works. I'm just showing you it works. The fact that it's this obvious with even just four transistors of exactly the same manufacture, same batch even. It's a neat little magic trick, isn't it? So while you admire that, I'll be seeing you.